don't care too much about the following. I don't care too much about the likes or anything. They're a byproduct most of the time of me putting that care, that effort into what I post. Hi, and welcome to Color and Coffee, a podcast that focuses on the craft of color grading and the artists behind it. I'm your host, Jason Bodak, and each week we'll sit down with some of the most talented and creative colorists in the industry and have a casual chat from one colorist to another. We'll share their stories, their insights, their grading tips, and of course, their beverage of choice. Whether you're a seasoned colorist or just starting out in the industry, join us for some great color discussion. Strap in, grab your mug, you're listening to Color and Coffee. I'm so excited to welcome today to this episode, Jake Pierre He is a Louisiana-based DP, he's a colorist, and he is a trainer. So welcome to this episode, Jake. So happy to have you. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. So first and most importantly, the clearly the most important question of the episode, what are you drinking today? All right. Well, was, that was the one question I wasn't prepared for. We've just got the uh, ghost. Let's see what flavor is this one. It's the ghost energy drink. I've kind of been on these for a while. It's a sour watermelon warheads flavor. And it is it is definitely definitely pronounced. Uh, my wife hates these, but <laughs> they're my favorites. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you need something to get you through the day, that definitely sounds oh, yeah. like it's going to get you there. It's a good kick, a lot of focus, so keeps me dialed in. Man, that thing would melt my stomach. Power to you, man. <laughs> Very so, intense. Yeah. I bet. I got the. I'm sipping on the traditional Starbucks blonde espresso here with a little bit of almond milk. Nothing too crazy, but that's a good call. That's a good call. So I'm really excited to have you on the podcast here. Uh, I've been a follow of yours on Instagram for quite a while, and I've really been uh, a follower of your work. A couple things that have popped out to me is your incredible use of strong hues, especially like a teal orange kind of look. But before I even sort of jump into your work, I'd like to hear a little bit more about your background. How did you get started as a colorist? How did you get started as a DP? Really, like, how did you get into this business? We all sort of fall into our roles as colorists. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about how did you become a colorist? Yeah, I think um, one interesting characteristic from all the colorists I've heard from is that no one actually like started off seeking out to be a colorist. It just they started off in one role and it kind of transitioned in some way or form. Uh, and for me, living in Louisiana, there's not a lot of big projects around here. There's not a lot of um, bigger agencies. There's nobody shooting, you know, high dollar commercials, music videos, or you know, films, at least not anymore in my area. Uh, but growing up, I was always shooting my own videos and editing them, just doing every step of the process. And I can cons consistently found myself really, really enjoying the process of taking log footage as I started shooting with more and more high-end cameras and turning that into a, a linear viewable image that had its own style. Uh, I love just the visual art of storytelling through color. Um, and then once I discovered that that was you know, an, its own role that I could pursue remotely and I could start working with people that I looked up to that were you know, in LA or Chicago, New York, across the world. Uh, one of my first remote clients was in Australia. And that concept not only just, I mean, blew my mind and got me really, really excited for the opportunity to work uh, on, on bigger projects. Um, you know, I just loved doing it. And so I started working on my skills as a colorist, getting more professionally dialed in, I guess you could say, um, and, and started building up a client list and a, uh, just a, a group of kind of interested parties that I could go to uh, and start working with as a beginner. And of course, that's continually grown. And here we are today. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's been a, a fun process brick by brick building that uh that house uh, but it, yeah it's been it's been a blast that is fantastic man i love to hear when people literally find things that they love and then they dive into that deeper so one of the things that i am curious about is you're a, both a dp and a colorist um did you get into being uh, a cinematographer first and then you were interested in coloring your own material um or did you get into photographing afterwards so I starting off, I mean, I, I shot a lot of my own stuff growing up, uh, me and a good friend of mine who I still work with today, uh, we grew up together, basically just brothers and, um, the stuff we shot obviously started off real bad and over time continued to get better. 
ended up doing a few paid jobs uh, out of high school and it was enough interest and enough passion. I was, I was good enough to where out of high school going into college, I was able to turn it into a business where I was shooting commercials, uh, event recap videos, a lot of the same stuff that any young videographer DP is, is working on. Um, and so, yes, at the first that was all shooting my own stuff. And then it worked more into the YouTube space. Uh, I met a, a friend of mine uh, by the name of Gavin who uh, had a very small YouTube channel uh, based on the car scene, uh, a lot of drag racing and stuff. And, I had the idea that we could take the content he was creating uh, for a smart audience and mixing my skill set with a, we'll call it a underprivileged uh, market when it comes to videography. There's, there wasn't a lot of great visual storytelling in the car YouTube space. Uh, I thought we could blend those two passions and make something really interesting. Uh, from there, we started going way over the top in, uh, in cinematography, even if it was bad starting off, um, and, and just using that visual storytelling techniques to deliver content uh, that was based around taking cars out, racing them, breaking them, and then fixing them. Uh, and so that was where I really got to start being more creative and actually putting my work in front of a bigger audience. Uh, that channel grew to, I think it was well over 600, 750,000 subscribers by the time I left. Um, and that was when I started to kind of refocus on the cinematography storytelling aspect of things from a freelance standpoint and starting a business that would work on commercial projects, still doing more documentary style work and hopefully commercials. Um, but then COVID hit. And that was when I kind of had to shift gears. I'd already been doing color for a while, but not so much remotely uh, or not so much for uh, other clients necessarily. And so through COVID, I started to transition having to work remotely because, you know, we couldn't go anywhere. Um, and yeah, honestly, I think I owe a lot of it to that initial two week lockdown that we had forcing me to transition and uh, kind of retarget what my business goals were and reevaluate how can I make this sustainable. And of course, remote work was the answer there. Uh, but it wasn't just remote. It was also that, you know, it was my favorite part of the process was always you know, coloring. And so, uh, yeah, the two just really, the, the situation and my skill set, my desires all kind of blended together uh, to kind of land me in this position as a freelance colorist. Yeah, man, I can completely understand your story there. It sounds pretty similar to my own where I had to to make some big decisions about uh I was doing something in my my free time and sort of wandered into to being a colorist and then eventually decided this was my favorite part of the process as well and had to make that big decision of, is this something I want to do permanently? Mm -hmm. So I can completely understand. And congratulations to taking that big initiative uh, during the pandemic and deciding to that this was going to be something you're going to do seriously because uh, it clearly has worked out quite well for you based off your social media. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 something that uh, I can't take too much credit for because I was not necessarily forced into that position, but it was a result of variables around me. And uh, I've been very blessed uh, to, to have met the people that I've met with, uh, to have been given the opportunities by the people that have given me opportunities um, and helped me make a name for myself in that industry and, and build somewhat of a reputation that lends itself to be trusted by bigger, um, more I guess, well-rounded uh, individuals, entities, and agencies. And so it, it's been a lot of uh, kind of resume building. Absolutely. Let's talk about some of your your approaches to, to social media, because that's one of the things that uh, originally impressed me about you, uh, your Instagram account, and uh, encouraged me to bring you on the show is I wanted to talk to you about your, your social media strategies. I'll be perfectly honest. I'm just blown away by your Instagram. Um, as, as a colorist who has been in the business before Instagram really sort of took hold um, and has sort of watched it uh, essentially become our our resume. I'll be perfectly honest. It's overwhelming sometimes uh, to to see people on Instagram and to see so much great work. Um, so to to talk to somebody who is is doing quite well on Instagram, I'd love to hear sort of some of your your strategies or some of the way that you approach your own social media. Yeah, well, there's um, there's a couple sides to it. And I think I'm my answer is probably going to lend itself to be a little bit um, paradoxical. And what I mean by that is I care about Instagram. I care what the content looks like. I care um, what kind of image I put out about my work um, and, and the type of work I do, the style I, I, I guess you can say possess um, and that, that goes into my work. But I also don't care too much about the following. I don't care too much about the likes or anything. They're a byproduct most of the time of me putting that care, that effort into what I post. 
Um, I'm not going crazy over algorithms and everything. There are certain trends I'll try and hop on every now and then, but only when I think it's you know, entertaining or fun to do it. Uh, so it's not super disciplined, if I'm being honest. Um, but I always have been able to kind of recognize trends, uh, figure out and, and kind of uh, just predictable, figuring out what's going to work, what may not work. And sometimes I'm surprised by uh, a lot of times the stuff I put out that I think is going to do really well just doesn't. And then stuff that I didn't expect to do well at all just blows up. Um, and I think that comes from repetition, just constantly putting out more media, um, sharing as much as you can, learning that way, what works and what doesn't. But, you know, especially with the way something has gone over the past several years, it rewards consistency. It rewards multiple posts uh, over a consistent period of time. And I think, you know, you have to have a hundred posts to have one that blows up. And so that's something I don't do very well. I don't post a ton. I don't post uh, very consistently. Uh, I've kind of gotten to the point where I just post when I want to. And that's what I think has been most sustainable for me because through it all, it has to be sustainable. Uh, same thing as a diet. If you're trying to you know, lose weight or gain weight, whatever your goal is, you have to do something that's consistent if you want to maintain that desirable outcome. And social media is the same way. You can get burnt out really quickly. Uh, you can it really can mess with your head when you're just going after a certain number of likes. And if you don't get that number, you feel like you failed or your work isn't good enough. So I try to maintain a healthy balance and a healthy respect for what it is and, and what it isn't. So that's that's kind of my outlook on it. That's a, a great way of looking at it. Is it something that you're doing per project? Are you scheduling like something per week to just sort of sit down and pump out some stuff? Or it's just, you know what, I'm going to sit down and do some content was. now. Um. I think my schedule is so my schedule is so unpredictable, uh, just with deadlines either shifting or moving, or you know meetings falling here and there, and then I decide to shoot content uh, that goes on a different channel for for whatever reason. Um, I just f- fill the gaps. I think it's one thing I'm trying to adopt now is more productive procrastination. So if I get bored with a certain project here, I don't want to start on on something else. I'll take that time and say, okay, what can I do to still be productive in this time where I'm putting off doing something else. Um, so that may be you know, organizing a post, figuring out what the, I don't know, the next kind of real trend would be or finding a good audio to use. Um, and a lot of times it just comes from scrolling and I'll, I'll hear a certain sound or see a certain reel and think, Oh, I could you know, kind of adopt that and uh, manipulate it a little bit to fit my genre, my niche and, and try and create something that way. But a lot of times it's just spontaneous ideas. Um, I'll have the idea, go find the media I need to fit it. and then figure out how to post it. I love that. Pro- uh, productive procrastination, attempting to, to use your own negative <laughs> tendencies towards a positive goal. That's yeah, a great I'm a, I'm great a big tip. procrastinator too, so I can hopefully be pretty productive through that. Or at least attempt to use uh, those tendencies towards a positive end, yeah. which is yeah. clearly what you're doing instead of sitting around and watching mm-hmm. YouTube or Netflix or whatever streaming service you are uh, attuned to to the end of the day. Exactly. One of the other topics that I wanted to jump on now is you have uh, not only a company, but you run a couple of different things. What you have a color grading course, uh, you have a shop. You're quite a busy guy. So what are you planning right now? What are your what are your sort of goals going forward right now? Yeah, well, I mean, right now, you mentioned the course. That's uh, one of the things I'm still trying to dial in. Uh, we've got a good group of, of members and students already. So I'm trying to make sure I devote enough attention to those students that are already there and you know, answering their questions. Just before our call, we had a 30-minute call I just had with another student who was asking me questions that were kind of specific. And he was messaging me. And I said, hey, let's go ahead and hop on a call. We'll answer it that way. Just ways that I think if I've been able to get a mentor that could just directly answer my questions in a lot of ways I did. Um, that's something that's invaluable because so many times I'm sure you've experienced this and I still experience it now where I'm working through a problem and I need a solution that I can't just search on YouTube or Google and find the answer to, uh, whether it's just because it's so nuanced that that information is not out there, or if the solutions I found aren't working, it's so much just of a, of a stress relief to be able to ask someone that you know, respect and trust and get the answer that way. So that's one of the things I'm, I'm spending a lot of free time on right now is, is better designing the course, taking questions that I get frequently, building them into new tutorials and lessons there. Of course, through YouTube as well. Not that everything is kind of split up into a course versus YouTube material. It's just that usually in the course, I go a lot more in depth because 
I could have more foreknowledge presented for the topic because we're following a linear train of thought. So there can be a little bit more preliminary information that can be added to those types of lessons. So there's the advantage there, but it's not really so much of a gatekeeping tactic. One big area of what I'm working on, I do have the shop where you can purchase, you know, digital downloads and some merchandise that I thought was cool. And I designed that a few years ago, but that's really easy. Once you build the product and launch it, it kind of runs itself. I don't really do much promotion with that. I think there's a couple of videos on my channel where I talk about the product itself and show you if you, if you want to use it, here's how, um, but that's you know, fairly minimal. And then the other big chunk of my time, of course, is working on actual color projects uh, through clients. So one of the the projects that we were talking about recently was a really, really great piece from a company called Coral Gardeners. And we were talking about it offline. And I'd like for you to, to talk about it a little bit. It's a really interesting piece that you told me about. It has a lot of mixed material. You want to talk about it a little bit? Yeah, it's definitely got a lot of mixed material. A lot of the, the best footage was from uh, Red Komodo. This was shot, I want to say, coming up on two years ago now. And it just made its way into the post-production stage, uh, I think starting in, well, for me at least, November uh, last year, so November 2022. And uh, that's when I first got my hands on it. It's it's a very cool piece um, focusing on the Coral Gardeners. Uh, it's directed and kind of hosted by Sam Potter, directed by Drew Longest. And uh, it's, it's a really fun piece that I got to work on, uh, telling that story. And what was, I think, one of the more interesting aspects of my role in that film that Sam really had a role in kind of directing me to, to pursue was uh, this depressing underwater footage that obviously it all looked the same, but we needed it to feel more upset, uh, feel more bland, bleached, and kind of dead because we're showcasing the stark difference between all this liveliness around you know, the waters there. But then when you go underneath and you see all the death uh, and the destruction of these just dead basically bleached corals uh, we needed that to feel different we wanted to highlight how contrasted uh, those two environments were um so we spent a lot of time and you know, the first uh, first draft i sent him uh he was like cool but it's not enough it needs to feel more dead and so that did come out in the final pass um but it was it was really cool because that was a project that aside from just building a good look for the piece as a whole really pushed me to work on my storytelling devices when it came to working with groups, working with shared nodes, and really figuring out what a certain scene needs to make it feel the way the director uh, wants the audience to feel. Isn't it amazing when we can take all of those toys and finally put it toward like a narrative purpose? Yeah. And it's yeah. like, ah. Because I mean, Resolve gives you all is. these different tools and sometimes it's overwhelming. Like, I only need a few of these, but every now and then there's a certain instance where you have to have that certain tool that's way down in the menus um, and you need to know how to use it, how to utilize it in your workflow to take advantage of it because it really does come in handy when its purpose is actually finally needed. Um, so yeah, it was, it was really fun getting to experiment and test uh, different tools that aren't, that I'm not jumping to that often, finding new ways to use new tools that like I said, I just don't use a lot. And I love being pushed creatively to, to get to that level where I'm having to experiment more and it's not just immediately jumping to the certain tool. I'm having to think before I actually go into it. Um, and then, yeah, like you mentioned, it was a massive mixed media project um, just due to the circumstances of the timeline of that post-production process. We didn't have the opportunity to send over all the raw files uh, with an XML, have everything conformed that way. So we just did a bacon blade, basically a ProRes Quad 4, um, got everything conformed that way. But of course, if you're familiar with that process, you don't necessarily know which camera all the different clips are coming from. And so we had, I think, five or six different cameras all in all, and we knew three or four of them. Yeah, we knew four of the cameras. There was one or two that were kind of a toss up just because of where everyone was at the time and how much of a scramble it was at a certain point. We couldn't get that information. And so I just had to kind of build in my own uh, and work from there. So Obviously, no, no project is, is perfect. Everyone comes with their own challenges uh, to overcome. And I think as a colorist, your job is to make sure nobody else feels the burden of those challenges, uh, to kind of take that, that stress off of everyone else. And sometimes you just got to do what you got to do.
So that actually leads me to a great question. So when you get in this situation and you have, uh, you should mention three or four different cameras that you were able to get the information for, and then you have this one that you just don't have the, any information for. And I mean, I know a lot of colorists that would say, you know what, I can't, I can't work with this, or there's nothing I'm going to be able to do. How do you deal with the client in that situation? Well, I mean, if you look at it this way, there's certain times where, I mean, what if you're working on a documentary for Netflix? And uh, there's some archival footage that's being brought in from who knows where. If you don't know where that footage is from, you have two options. You can build your own contrast and saturation, which is probably going to be technically inaccurate, but you can get to a desirable outcome. Or you can just throw your hands up in the air and say, I can't figure it out. I quit. So I think the, the, the right decision is pretty easy to make there. And there's no reason not to, to go that route. If, if it's one or the other, um, obviously the option to choose is to figure out how to build your own contrast there. And it helps having a little bit of a technical background, understanding of color spaces and how to kind of build your own transform, whether it's technically accurate or mildly inaccurate, that's okay. If you're getting a good enough outcome uh, at the end of the day, that's all that matters. And sometimes, like I said, that's all you can do. You can try and go down the pipeline, figure out who shot it and, and do some investigative research if you can. But again, that's not always an option for a number of different reasons. It, it may not be possible. And so, yeah, like I said, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. And then when you, you get into the situations where you don't know, hopefully you have you have access to communities like like yours, like the Colors Blueprint, Mixing Light, Lift Gamma Gain, and then you can reach out and mm -hmm. bring in the community to help you with stuff like that. Cause exactly. Yeah. Ask people who've done it before. Absolutely. Um, one of the things I did want to ask you, because you caught my curiosity, is what did you end up doing with uh, some of that uh, that coral footage to, to get it looking more bleached? Well, the first step I did was try and work with just improper input transforms and find one that got me close. And of course, I just experimented with it to see if we could, because I, I was given a hint at what it was. And so I, I tried it out and I, I constantly was noticing some improper hues there um, and some mistreatment of the highlights and shadows. So I was able to find out that wasn't it. So I kind of just, like I said, built my own through uh, a custom curve and playing with the uh, RGB mixer just a little bit to, to kind of shift the primaries around and add in saturation that way, which like I said, I mean, I don't think anybody will ever notice for the most part. And if me going back at it, uh, there's a bunch of things I wish I could have changed and continue to refine, make it a little bit better. But um, yeah, I think most people will never notice and that's not an excuse to, to be more relaxed about it, but it is at the end of the day, the, the truth of the situation. And so there's only so much you can do in certain scenarios and you just have to do the best you can. I'll admit that I don't think I ever look at it back at a job, especially the no tree and go, I would have done that differently, especially oh, yeah. the more time that passes. Um, but I, I looked at it and I can't tell which shots are the ones that are technically improperly <laughs> good, transformed. Good. Um, uh, so it does look great. Um, and then the the one other thing that I wanted to to dig in the weeds a little bit is to to get that coral looking more sad mm -hmm. as as you were calling it. What did you end up relying on? Let's see. I think part of it was color boost, and then uh, there's actually a third party plugin I use that has uh, an option for uh, basically it's it's a um, bleach bypass look, and so I kind of blended a bleach bypass bleach bypass. Um, with a few different saturation tools, as well as actually the color warper, which is not a tool I go to very often. But in certain instances, you know, when you're talking about underwater footage, there's a pretty strong shift to blue. And so I locked down some of the blue channels and then uh, took kind of a, a radius of saturation and desaturated it all. So just kind of brought it all in, but locked the blues off so they wouldn't be affected too much because we didn't want to desaturate the blues. The goal was for it to feel blue and desaturated to keep the underwater feeling and also so as to not uh, take away the color from the water so much that it felt jarring from happier you know, underwater footage to the desaturated kind of bleached underwater footage. Yeah, you wanted a, like a bleached monochromatic. Yes. Yes. And at first I thought it was going to be too much, Very but cool. yeah, the director, uh, Sam said he loved it. And so we actually took it even further uh, after the first pass that I sent him. Gotta love it when a client takes your look that yeah. you thought was a 10 and says 12, <laughs> yeah. please. 12. It doesn't happen very often, but I was, I was really excited in this case. That was, was what he wanted to go with. 
Well, it's a beautiful piece and it's on a really, really interesting subject matter. Uh, we'll definitely have a link in the notes for, for everybody that wants to take a look at it. I definitely recommend that you view this incredible YouTube video on Coral Gardeners. Jake, where, if people wanted to find you on Instagram, on YouTube, where, where can we find and learn more about you if we wanted to f- learn more about your color grading course, learn more about your work in general? Yeah. Uh, so Instagram, it's pretty simple. The handle is J-V-K-E, Jake, but the A is a V. And then on YouTube, same thing, J-V-K-E dot P. Uh, so you know, last name's purely. So YouTube, they already had the JVKE taken. So I didn't get lucky with that handle, but you can also just search Jake purely colorist or color grading tutorials on YouTube. You'll uh, find me that way. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, the main two channels I'm most active on and yeah, YouTube and Instagram are the main two, but not, not too much since going and checking me out on Twitter. Haven't posted there in a few years, but if you're interested on Instagram and YouTube, that's where to find me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure chatting with you today. And for Color and Coffee, I'm Jason Bodak, and I will see you guys in the next episode. Have a good one and happy grading. And that's our show. Thank you so much to our guest, Jake Pierley, for coming on. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, YouTube, or your podcast app of choice. If you're using Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please leave us a review. It helps us quite a bit. If you are looking for DaVinci Resolve tools, please be sure to visit our sponsor, Pixel Tools. We'll see you guys in two weeks with another great interview. Be safe and happy grading.